everybody. Welcome to our next phase in our uh, look at the Aurora Lights. Uh, we're here with a, a research associate, Don Hampton from the Geophysical Institute in Fairbanks, part of the University of Alaska system. And he's a specialist on the Aurora Borealis and particularly how we look at the Aurora Borealis. So Don, tell us a little bit about what causes this phenomenon that's so beautiful in the northern sky. Right, so the, the energy that, uh, that uh, provides us with the aurora, it all starts with the sun. Um, if we didn't have the sun uh, putting out this thing called the solar wind, we would never see aurora. So the, the solar wind is charged particles that come off the surface of the sun. Uh, the sun is very hot, as we all know. Uh, and it, just like if you put a cup of tea down in the morning and have the sunshine across the top of that tea, there's a little bit of steam coming off of that tea because it's nice and hot compared to the room. Uh, because the sun's so hot, there are particles coming off the surface of the sun all the time. Uh, and uh, they, they come out as this stream of charged particles and they come out very fast. They're moving like 400 kilometers per second by the time they get to Earth. Um, so that sounds very fast, but space is a big thing. Um, those charged particles, uh, they're not very dense. It's not like its not like a stream we would have, like a wind we would have here, but it is a, a lot of particles coming out. Um, when they run into Earth's magnetic field, um, they couple into those, that Earth's magnetic field and the, the energy they have uh, sort of builds up energy in our magnetic field. And the particles that are in the solar wind are the particles that actually end up coming down as the particles that create the aurora. Primarily what we see when we see aurora, like the, the one behind me, uh, those are electrons. Those are the outer parts of atoms and molecules uh, that are energized and they come down and they hit the, the atoms, molecules in our upper atmosphere um, and create the light you see uh, in the pictures like that. So typically the best time to watch aurora is what's called magnetic midnight. And, and that's typically around local midnight. It can be a couple of hours off either way. So it, you know, in, in Fairbanks, magnetic midnight is more about 1.30 a.m. Uh, right now when we're in, in daylight time, it's about 2.30 a.m. when we're in standard time, or maybe the opposite of I never can remember. Um, uh, so it, it's, it's basically late at night. It's the most likely to have that. Now, if, you've got a, if we've got a really strong energetic solar wind going on at the time, it might actually it might actually happen a little bit earlier. So it may be that when, um, so that maybe uh, you know when the sun goes down, you may actually already be seeing aurora. So that just depends on how how energetic the solar wind is at the time, uh, 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 for for a given night. Uh, most nights it, it it tends to be pretty quiet until you know eleven thirty to 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 uh, one thirty or so in the morning here. In So if, if I understand correctly, the image behind you was taken with a longer exposure. So it gives maybe a different experience of viewing the Northern Lights than I might see with my eye, because I always think of the Northern Lights as like a ribbon um, going across the sky where if this is a longer exposure, you're going to kind of get the, the, the trail of that ribbon as well. So it fills up a little bit more of, of the image. Is that true? Yeah, that, that's true. And, and so the, the, whether it's a ribbon or in this case, it it's, looks like multiple ribbons, but that's because basically the aurora is right overhead of, uh, where we were at Poker Flat that night. Um, so so the, the, most of the, the, what we call a, a rural arc, like the one that comes sort of poking out the top of my head, um, is fairly narrow. It's, it's a few kilometers wide, but can, it can be several thousand kilometers uh, long and usually in the east-west direction. Um, and, and very often on a, on a busy night, uh, like this night was, you'll get multiple arcs sort of stacked up like that. Now, if, 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 if the same night I was down in Anchorage, I'd have to look north to see these arcs. And from, the, from Anchorage, they would look much more like ribbons. And I think uh, from Juneau, that's kind of what you'll typically see. Every now and then you'll get an active enough storm that you'll have a roar right overhead as well. But that's pretty rare for Juneau.
So if we want to capture not just a still image of the aurora and maybe we use artwork or something to create more movement of the aurora, um, is there a specific pattern of movement that you could describe that someone might try to emulate? Sure. If you look over my, uh, uh, my left shoulder, um, then you can see that uh, that arc is not just uniform. It's actually got sort of vertical stripes in it. And so that's what's called a raid arc. Uh, and, and that's pretty typical when you get fairly active aurora, that, that it's not just a uniform curtain. Uh, you get these sort of stripes. And those uh, vertical stripes actually will tend to move one direction or another. Depends on what time of night it is, which way they move. So very often, yeah, you'll get sort of like a picket fence effect and that picket fence will sort of move uh, east or west. Uh, the, other, the other one over my left shoulder, um, you can see that's not just a nice straight arc, that's actually got some curl to it. And so very often you get these, uh, what are called curls. Uh, sometimes you get these, these even sort of tighter folds in there as well. So yeah, you, you, you get quite a bit of motion when you get very active aurora. Uh, and, and the combination of those picket fence uh, vertical stripes moving east and west, and then maybe having the, the arc itself sort of fold up on itself and then sort of straighten back out is another, another motion that's fairly common when you're watching. So last question, uh, we, I think that the Geophysical Institute has a hand in helping predict when the aurora will be quite strong or uh, more visible. Um, can you explain a little bit about the prediction process and where to go to find those predictions? Sure, yeah, the Geophysical Institute, uh, gi.alaska.edu, um, has, a, has a specific uh, prediction page. Uh, we, we pretty much now rely on what, what's called the Space Weather Prediction Center, which is a uh, uh, National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, one arm of theirs. Uh, so the, what goes into that, like I said, every, uh, everything that, that causes the aurora is basically based on what happens with the sun. Uh, so there are several satellites that are constantly watching the sun and looking for the events on the sun and around the sun that are likely to cause uh, the solar wind to intensify and cause these these overall magnetic storms and then and then sort of the more detailed uh, activations we see here when we're watching the aurora. Um, so two things we look for one's called what's one's is what's called a coronal mass ejection, and that's when the solar wind kind of gets trapped for a while on the surface of the sun and then comes out in this big burst. Um, and we've got enough satellites that can sort of track where that's going to go. Now once it comes out and gets away from the sun, it's more or less invisible, but uh, when it first leaves the sun, you can sort of get a trajectory of where it's going to go, and that's that's one prediction. Um, so even at the speeds I was talking about, that solar wind moves pretty fast, but uh, it takes about three or four days to get from the sun to here. And so usually, if you see one of these coronal mass ejections head out, then they can sort of predict what's going to go on. Now, the the sun actually goes through this 11-year cycle of being fairly active, and then going down to pretty quiescent stage. And and right now. Uh, uh, 2020, it's a little quiet, although we're starting to see a little bit of activation start up again. Uh, but even during those quiet times, uh, you can still get uh, 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 a quite good aurora. Uh, what happens then is you get what's called a coronal hole, which is sort of an outer surface of, this, of the sun, uh, is not uniform then, and, and you get a region where you get uh, these high speed particles. I mean, it's the solar, it's the solar wind, but it's just sort of a, a region where these uh, particles are very high speed when they come out. So we call it a high speed stream. Um, and it's sort of like a, 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 a garden sprinkler, uh, that's usually a fairly localized place in the sun. And so when the sun rotates around, you get this sort of uh, water sprinkler effect. Uh, but the sun comes around every, every 27 days. And so if you saw this high speed stream 27 days ago, you're likely to start seeing again. And in fact, right now, um, uh, late October, we're kind of expecting the next, next high speed stream to come around. So it's good that uh, here in Fairbanks, we got some clear skies and apparently in Juneau, you even have some clear skies. So hopefully we're gonna, we're gonna see a little bit of aurora in the next two or three days. Um, so right now we're kind of relying on what happened to the sun 27 days ago to sort of expect what happens again. There aren't that many coronal mass ejections right now, but I think in the next two or three years, that's gonna start picking up again. And I think by about 2025, we're gonna be back at what's called a solar max. And that's where we get a lot of activity on the sun and pretty much every three or third or fourth day, we get enough solar wind activity to create greater aurora. Well, 
Well, that's great. Yeah, we do have a little bit of clear skies here in Juneau right now. Um, perhaps not while people are watching this video, but uh, it's good to note that probably the northern lights are happening even when we can't see them here in Juneau above the clouds. Yeah, that's right. Well, and with our cameras, we can see that. I mean, the, the cameras we have are, are filtered specifically for the colors you see. And so we can tell when the aurora is happening. We just can't tell much detail about what's going on, but we can, we can see that there's active aurora going on. Well, thank you, Don, for uh, sharing some time with us today and talking about the aurora. We really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to seeing those northern lights and knowing a little bit more when we see them. Thanks to yeah. you. Yes, good luck. Uh, it's, it's, it's always a great thing to see aurora. I, 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 I'm always happy to watch Aurora again. Right, and it's a nice thing in the winter to celebrate <laughs> and light up the night a little bit from Absolutely. long, dark nights. All right, thanks.